That's the funny part. I am the joke, right? Anyway, so trying to come up with a sermon for uh, Palm Sunday. So I thought maybe what would be a good idea is if I took the Psalms and I wrote them on the palm fronds. But then, you know, I kind of thought about it and not a good idea. Reading palms, that's against scripture. That's actually, I like that one. That's good. That's good, right? Welcome back, Nancy. Nice to have Nancy back with us. How was Texas? Seeing grandchildren? And we were actually cold here, too, but it was wet and cold, so not so much fun. Anyway, praise God. Everybody stretch your hands forward, please. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you to bless the tithes, bless the gifts, Lord, that have been given. Lord, you said we can give expecting to receive. And so we thank you for that. That's just faith, Lord. So we ask you to open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that can't be contained. Lord, we ask for protection. We ask for anointing. And we ask for an anointing this morning to understand and receive and grasp your word. That we would be transformed by it. We ask your Holy Spirit to begin moving in our heart even this moment. That we would be immersed in the washing of your word. That that which needs to be cleansed from our minds and hearts will be washed away by your power. And that your Holy Spirit will shine in us, evidencing the wisdom that we gain from your word. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Okay, so Palm Sunday. Two years ago, 2013, we went through an exhaustive exegesis of uh, Matthew 21, so we don't need to do that again. By the way, I, I meant to mention this uh, at the 8.30 service. If any of you guys want one of the study sheets from 2013, I have a couple, uh, and it breaks down the exegesis of, of Matthew 21, explains a whole bit about the donkeys and the whole bit. Uh, but let's just go over and review what is happening. As you turn to John chapter 12. And when you get to John chapter 12, just hold your thumb in your Bible. Palm Sunday, Jesus has been ministering for three and a half years. Now he finally arrives to Jerusalem. And the people of Jerusalem have heard, have seen the miracles that Jesus has done. This is the man who was able to speak to a storm and say, peace be still. This is a man who was able to raise the dead. Jairus' daughter, Talitha Kumi, he speaks, and she comes back to life. Lazarus, come forth, and the stone is rolled away, and the dead man who had been decaying and stinking for three days emerges alive, still wrapped in his shroud. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame jump up and walk. Demons come screaming out of people who have been oppressed and possessed for years, transformed lives left and right. This is the man. The man they've been waiting for. The Hamashiach, the Messiah, the Davidic king. Now when I say Davidic king, this is what I mean. They mean a political king. They mean a king that will bless them physically where money will be theirs, prosperity will be theirs, health will be theirs, and they will gain all the land that has been promised them. There they are in this tiny strip of land, uh, even smaller than what they have today, and the Romans are occupying that space. And they're looking for a Davidic king. They're looking for a Messiah, a Hamashiach, the Messiah, who will come and not only throw off the yoke of Rome, but will also regain for them their land. Now, what is the promised land? What is supposed to belong to the Jews according to the covenant between God and Abraham? Is it the land they have now? No. As a matter of fact, it is not only more, it is much more. Bernie, the land that God promised Israel that is supposed to be the promised land stretches all the way from the Mediterranean Sea to the Euphrates River. It goes all the way up to Azerbaijan and all the way down to parts of Egypt. Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, 
all these nations, according to God, are part of the promised land. And they're expecting, the Jews in Jerusalem, are expecting that Hamashiach will come and will not only defeat all the foes of Israel that are occupying that land, their ambition goes well beyond that because the promise of God is beyond that. God promised that all this land was there. Now I want you to stop and think about it for a minute. Where is the richest land in the world right now? All in the Middle East. Because of what? That was originally meant to be whose? Have you ever stopped to think about this? All those billions and trillions of dollars locked away in that land was originally intended to belong to the Jews. So when they are sitting there fighting over this tiny strip of land, excuse me, but not only does the Bible say that they are not supposed to give away their land to accommodate any terrorist uh, uh, hostage mandate for peace, but they're actually supposed to be retaking the land that was theirs. That's, what's, that's what a Zionist is. A Zionist is somebody who believes that not only is Israel supposed to possess its own land, but it's supposed to retake that which God has said is supposed to belong to them. So here comes Jesus. And they've heard that he is able to have power over natural forces like storms. That he can suspend physical reality. People who had sat on the hill and seen a little boy come up to Jesus with five loaves and two fish and saw the man pray over these meager provisions suddenly get fed. 5,000 men get fed. Now, if we just fed the men in this room but everybody was fed, how many people would actually be fed? at least twice, if not more, if you count children, yes? So how many people were actually fed by these five loaves and two fish? We don't know, but there were people in Jerusalem who saw it. This is the guy who walked on water. So they have an easy time believing that he is more than able to mobilize the entire nation. And everything is in place. Everybody hates the Romans. Everybody is willing to ch chip in and get behind a great general like David or like Joshua. And it's not lost on them that he is from the house of David. So he's going to emulate his great, 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 great grandfather. But his name is Yehoshua. His name is the same name as the great general who walked into Canaan in the first place and took the land. Everybody hates the Romans. Everybody's behind the Sanhedrin. The zealots, the Zionists of the days, are, are, are all embedded throughout the country. So it is set up, it is primed for a takeover. And now, here he comes. Ana, Yehovah. Yehoshana. Ana, Yehovah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now they're ready. Because they're waving their palm fronds. Why? Take a look. John chapter 12. It says, The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast, that is Passover feast, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches, went out to meet him, laid their cloaks, their talit, on the ground, as we discussed two years ago, exhaustively. The talit, the prayer shawl that covers their head, symbolized who they were. Their family crest is on it. Their occupation is on it. Their grade uh, uh, of prosperity is on it. Is it made out of this material? Is it made out of that material? Is it dyed with this uh, kind of fruit? Or is it true tecolette blue? Coming from the tiny little seashells that are 70 feet plus below in the Mediterranean Sea. So difficult to get, but makes that deep purplish royal blue that is shown on rabbi's talits. And they're taking these, and they're throwing it on the ground. As a symbol, all that I have, my family, my family's wealth, everything I am, I lay at your feet because I recognize you are the Messiah. You're the one who is finally going to be 
the one who has been promised to us. Palm leaves, shouting. Hoshana, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Ana Yehovah. Hoshana Ana Yehovah is what they're shouting. Jesus found a young donkey, sat upon it. Because as it is written, do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. This is found in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. At first, the disciples didn't even understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize all these things had been written about him and they had done these things to him. Now, the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. These guys were there. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, this is the Pharisees now, this is getting us nowhere. Look, the whole world is going after him. So he's got everything behind him. They're laying their cloaks down. They're waving their palms. So Marilyn, the question I have this morning is this. How does that group that is waving palms and throwing their talits on the ground so that he can walk over it, go from praising his name on Sunday to five days later, either joining in a crowd that shouts crucify him or standing there and watching it happen and do nothing. Now, I got to tell you something. This is me personal. I know somebody who's walked on water. They try to kill him. I'm going to speak up. If I'm Jairus and it was my daughter who had been raised from the dead, nothing could prevent me from supporting and defending this guy. I'm standing there in Jerusalem. I know Lazarus. He's a friend of mine. Like Daryl is a friend of mine. You know, you have friends of Lazarus's in the city. He was dead. I know he was. Now he's alive. And you're going to kill this guy? Not only would I have been shouting at the top of my lungs when everybody's saying crucify him, not only would I have been shouting and yelling, but I would have grabbed a sword if I couldn't find a sword, a butter knife. I don't care what. I'll fight with my bare hands. But I'm not going to let this happen yet. Nobody stood up for it. All these people who had heard these things and seen these things, experienced these things firsthand, are either joining the voices of crucify him or standing there silent watching it happen. Implausible at first. Not so. Not so. There are, to me, three compelling reasons why this happens. Okay? Why? Why would the crowd change? To either join in the shout and crucify him or be silent. Why? Number one, they're frightened. They're frightened by the crowd. It is human nature to not want to oppose a large crowd. Humans tend to have a tribal mentality. And when they see everybody going in one direction, it's very, very difficult to be a lone person who stands against that direction. If it means you're going to lose love, respect, possibly money, but generally speaking, psychologists have found that is not the case. It's not the loss of material wealth that scares people when it comes to mob mentality. It is much more the acceptance, the camaraderie. Being, the danger is being excluded from the group. You don't want to be singled out and excluded from the group. And this group was hot. They were on fire. They're shouting, crucify him. Even Pilate, which we will talk about on Good Friday, was pleading with the crowd. 
When you look at the vocative nature of the Greek exegesis, you will see that Pilate was terrified. He was scared. He knew the guy had done nothing to deserve death. This is a kangaroo court, plain and simple, and he is a politician and a legalist. He knew this. And he's trying to find a way of assuaging this crowd, but this crowd is set on crucifying Jesus. Where are his supporters? Where are the guys who saw him raise the dead? Where are the guys that know he could walk on water and multiply food? They're either joining in the crucify him yells or be silent. Number one, they are afraid to oppose the crowd. Number two, and I believe this contributes, they felt abandoned. They felt abandoned by Jesus. Why did he allow himself to be arrested? Kule, why? They had seen people try to hurt Jesus before. They had seen people try to kill him before. And they had seen Jesus escape. In Luke chapter 4, verse 28, you don't have to turn there, but there's a group. He speaks in a synagogue. They don't like what he says. And it says in four, uh, Luke 4, 28, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard what he said. They got up, drove him out of town, took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But... He walked right through the crowd and went on his way. How did he do this? How would you escape from a mad crowd trying to grab you and throw you off the poly? Well, it says he just walked out of the midst of them. Two things are possible. Either one, he was like Adam. Now, we know Adam was created to be perfect. Jesus is the second Adam. Sin comes down through the iniquity of the fathers, but who was Jesus' father? God. So is he going to have any of those iniquities? No. We know that human beings only use between 8 and 12% of their intellect. You're actually going to be much more intelligent in heaven. Most people, Bernie, concentrate on a physical difference, but I think that pales in comparison to your difference in mental, intellectual perception and capacity when you get to heaven and how you will be able to understand all these things instantaneously simply because I, I mean I tried to ex- I, I tried to explain one time in a sermon what it would be like to have a 1000 IQ and it, it's it's very difficult to relate to somebody like that would be seen by us as almost insane at this point because their mind would work so fast but it's also known that not only do we only use part of our mental capacity, we also use part of our physical. I.e., there's a mother who has a hard time lifting a bowl of cookie dough in a bowl off the table. But when she sees her baby trapped under a car, what winds up happening? Adrenaline kicks in, her muscles contract, and she's able to actually move the car to save her baby. How is it that a 40-pound monkey can overpower a 300-pound man? Somehow the animals, muscles, and tendrils were contract and, and, and operate at a much higher level of efficiency than the humans does. Well, if Jesus was like Adam and he had all that capacity, he could easily walk through the midst of the crowd. When I was at Punahou, there was a young man there, our fullback, number 44. His name was Mosi Tatupu. I met him. I knew him. And his thighs were the size of my waist. I mean, maybe not now, but then. I had a 34-inch waist back then. Kali, he had 30-plus-inch thighs. When the boy would walk in front of you in the cafeteria, you could hear the thighs hitting each other because the muscles, he wasn't fat. There, I, I think it was like maybe 1% body fat or something. But his muscles on his inner thigh, how do you develop muscles on the inner thigh? Were so huge that they would ram into each other. And, and, and you know, we used to joke because we had the same kind of problem. Uh, uh, I was, you know, uh, my, my legs would rub together when I was a kid. And, you know, uh, in, in the middle where the corduroy was, it would wear off. Well, he showed me, oh, you think that's bad? 
and he lifts his leg, and it's all like skin. You can see through it because his thighs hit each other so hard. You know, within a week, he like burns through the corduroy. All the whaling is flattened, and now he's through to the skin because his thighs are so big. But when he's running down the field, Richard will tell you he remembers. He could, he could be holding six guys. And they're all holding on to his shoulder pads, his legs. He's like, tch, tch. And he's just marching down towards the, you know, uprights. Could Jesus have been like this? Easily he would have been ten times as strong as Mosi if this was true. Or, remember how he just appeared to the apostles. He walked through the wall and he was just, peace be with you, do not be afraid. Suddenly somebody walks through the walls and goes, hey, what's up? Don't be afraid. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little bit nervous by that. So maybe Jesus did that. My point is this. The apostles knew he could have escaped. They'd seen him do it before. And yet there he is in Gethsemane and he gets, he lets himself be carted off. Right when they're freaking out, right when they're afraid. They are so afraid that even tough guy Peter who pulled out, and you think it's all talk. Remember, he's surrounded by Roman guards. He whips out his sword and he cuts off the temple guard's ear. This is a man who is, he's action, he's not just yap. He's a fighter. But even he is so freaked out by the enormity of the full court press against Jesus that he not only remains silent, Bernie, but he denies knowing Jesus three times. One instance in which we know Jesus was right there, as close as I am to Koi. There was Jesus, and there he is standing there. I don't know him. I don't even know that guy. I've never met him before. What does it take to get people like that? They're confused by the fact that he abandoned them. And let's talk about number three, confusion. And this may be the most telling. They are confused by two things. Chalet, they're confused by things he did, and they're confused by things he said. They don't understand some of the things he's doing. There he is. He walks into Jerusalem, right? And everybody wants him to not only break free of Rome and get rid of Rome, but retake all this land that the children of Ishmael have occupied for years. Instead of mobilizing everybody against the Romans, he makes nice, nice with the Romans. There's a Roman centurion. He heals the guy's servant. He's polite to these guys. Meanwhile, who does Jesus go after? The Sanhedrin, the very guys we need. You tap into the Sanhedrin, these Pharisees and these ridiculously stupid Sadducees, but they hold sway over all the Jews. You make friends with them. We're in like Flint, baby. Instead, Jesus goes out of his ways to honk these guys off and make nice-nice with the Romans. And when the zealots, that's the modern Zionists, come up and try to make friends with them, he blows them off. What are you doing? I do not understand you. And as if his actions aren't confusing enough, what he says is even more confusing. I want to follow you. I want to throw off Rome. And here you're telling me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hurt you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Aren't you going to destroy this? Isn't the kingdom of God going to be raised up now? The kingdom of God is within you. It's in Syria. It's in Lebanon. It's in Iran and Iraq, Babylon. Assyria, these guys have this. Don't you understand that? The kingdom of God is within you. My kingdom is not of this world. I don't get it. I really don't get it. And he goes on to crazy things. Uplift me. Teach me something that I need for today. You must eat my flesh and drink my blood. What are you talking about? Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot inherit the kingdom. Oh, confusion. What the heck is he talking about? More to the point, prophecies. This is important. Why? Because Ezekiel 13 and Jeremiah 14 
make it clear through the law what you are supposed to do with a false prophet. Stone them. You are not to allow them to live. You must cut them off from the people. If you do not, their blood and their lies shall be upon you, and you shall be thrown into Tartarus along with them. God will count you as a false prophet if you do not revile this, these guys who are giving false prophecies. This is deadly dangerous. Now, do you mind if I preach for a second? For 35 years, I have heard people coming to me saying, the Lord showed me this. Now, with all due respect, 99% of the people I have met in my life cannot tell the difference between a good idea that they like and God actually speaking. If you want to know if God really said this to you, ask your leadership because that's what the Bible says you're supposed to do. Ask me. Ask Richard. Ask Daryl. Ask Joe. Ask Nancy. Ask Patty. Ask Mary. Ask Lillian. Do you think God could be the one who is saying this? and make sure it corresponds with the Word of God because God is not going to contradict Himself. God just showed me, uh, you know, I'm supposed to divorce my husband and, and, and marry this new guy. No, God did not tell you that. You think it's a good idea. I get that part. But do not lay this on God because the Bible says you're supposed to cut those people off, not talk to them, and stone them to death. Here's Jesus, and he says in Matthew 27, verse 40, I'm going to tear the temple down, and in three days, I'm going to rebuild it. What are you talking about? He's talking about the temple of his body, but it doesn't sound like that. It sounds like a prophecy that cannot, and frankly should not, come true. He says in Matthew 16, through the entire chapter, I am going to return in the clouds. Every eye shall see me, and every eye shall behold me. My angels shall gather my people from the four ends of the earth. You're kidding, right? No, not only that, but I'm the Messiah. Now, I don't know where this doctrine came from, that Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. I really don't. First time I heard it, I was in, in, in seminary still, and I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. I'm like, yes, he did. In Mark chapter 14, verse 62, he's talking to the high priest. Are you the Messiah, he's asked. Yes, I am, he answers. I don't know. That's kind of a done deal for me. In John 4, 25, he's talking with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. And she says, we're waiting for Hamashiach to come. He says, the one you're talking to is he, is he. Finally, and at last, Ma Matthew 16, 17, among others, he asks the disciples, who do men say that? Who do you think I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Hamashiach, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, don't tell anybody this, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven has. So stop already. He, he knew he was the Messiah, and he told him he was. But how do you back this one up? All these things contribute to them being frightened, them feeling abandoned, and them being totally confused. Okay? Now here's what the Lord showed me. This is us now. This is the church now. There's never been a time when Jesus has been under more attack. His word has been under more attack. The precepts of his word, his will, people verbally attacking, the ideological equivalent of crucify him because they don't want there to be a living God. Take prayer out of school. Stop even saying that. Pre Pledge of allegiance. Because it says one nation under God. You know somebody who is involved in same-sex relationship. Ah, 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 ah. Don't say anything that would be offensive. You know somebody who's had an abortion. Ah, ah, ah. 
be supportive. You know a woman or a man who are not married, but they're living together and having sex. Don't say anything. I, I, have, I, I, I know pastors who have churches filled with people who are cohabitating, who have told me they can't ever address that in their pulpit because if they do, they will lose four-fifths of their congregation. Just like people either joined in. Joined in, you say. Oh, yes. This very week. You know what the Presbyterian Church did? No? They okayed same-sex marriage. The, fr the Presbyterian Church is now supporting same-sex marriage. Not only are they being silent in the wave of this thing that God says is an abomination. Abomination, yes, it makes, jo it makes God sick. It makes Him want to vomit. But the Presbyterian Church is not only being silent about it. Now they have gone ahead and officially decreed this is okay and we're not only going to sanction same-sex marriages, we're going to perform them and we're going to stand there and ask God to bless Adam and Steve. The people are frightened. They don't want to say anything. Case in point, yesterday I saw a posting from Denny Nestle, my evangelist friend in Manassas, Georgia. So I reposted it on my wall. And I wrote him, I said, Denny, I want you to take a look at this. I'm reposting your post. And here's what the post said. Okay, and, and many of you saw it. It said, there have been eight studies that have gone on in the United States and in other places, in Europe, by qualified universities and laboratories that have done studies on identical twins. And they have found, see, because here's the thing, Sandra, when there's an identical twin, they're identical. One's an alcoholic, the other tends to be an alcoholic, 80% of the time. 80% of the time. One smokes, the other one smokes, 60% of the time. Various behavior issues and all these things, they are always the same. Same physical problems, sinus problems, sinus problems. Hearing problem, hearing problem. Gay, one is gay, the other one is gay. In case of men, less than 10% of the time, in the case of women, about 12%. Statistic data, statistical data shows there is no genetic link to homosexuality. It is not genetic. You are not created like this. That is statistical proof. Because if it was genetic, both twins would be gay. But only one is gay, and the other is not in 9 out of 10 times. Further, what they found is between the ages of 18 and 25, if they identify them to be same-sex oriented, by the time they pass the age of 25, Bernie, they change their mind, they go back to heterosexual. Now, these eight organizations don't know what to do with this information because nobody wants to hear it. The New York Times won't print it. Washington Post won't print it. Time Magazine won't touch it. Nobody wants it. It's fact. It's truth. But the plain fact of it is the same-sex agenda is all hepped up on. I was made to be this way. God made me like this. I'm going to blame it on God. Just like Eve blamed it on God. I'm going to blame it on God. Or Adam blamed it on God. The woman thou gavest to be with me. She did tempt me and I did eat. It's your fault. You gave me this woman. It's your fault. You made me like women so much. It's your fault. Uh, you, you made me male and I just can't resist the, this or I can't resist that. You made me like this. Well, in this case, he did not. And I told Denny, I said, I'm going to post this on my wall and you watch. Usually, about 50 people like my stuff. I said, not only will nobody like this, Nobody less than 30 years old will say they like it. Guess what? Nobody less than 30 likes it. I got six likes. More to the point, Denny himself is a global figure. He has thousands of followers. When he posts something like this, usually he gets anywhere between 700 to 900 likes. You know how many he got? 30. Because nobody wants to say anything negative about the same sex issue because they are frightened. They feel abandoned. 
I prayed for my father. I prayed for my mother. The Bible says I'm supposed to lay hands on the sick and they're supposed to get well, but he died anyway. She died anyway. I, you, the Bible says you're supposed to bless me with prosperity, but I'm still struggling for money. I'm still sick. I'm still this. I'm still that. Well, welcome to the human race. The Bible says man has destroyed the planet and that's the way it's going to be. But nonetheless, we want to blame God. We feel abandoned by him. And for that reason, we're not willing to stand up for him anymore when it comes to all these issues. We stand there and sit there silently watching this happen because we're confused by some of the things he has said and some of the things he has done and some of the things that he has allowed to happen in our life. We feel offended by him. We feel betrayed. Betrayal is the hardest thing in the human heart to get over. I trusted you, I believed in you, and you hurt me. The very one who I trusted to love me has hurt me. That is, it. That is the hardest thing to forgive in the human heart. And many people feel betrayed by God. They feel betrayed by Jesus. They're confused by Jesus. And there they are, frightened and abandoned and confused. So when they are shouting, crucify him, they're either joining along or they are just standing there, silent, saying nothing. But, give me five more minutes. I know I'm over time. I apologize for that. But, there are four people who stood at the cross. Four. It's John. Mary, his mother, Mary, his aunt, and Mary of Magdala. And even though everybody has left, in open view of everyone, there are four left who stay. Four who, by their presence, openly in front of everybody, make sure everybody knows, I support this guy. Why? Let's take Mary first and the aunt. Now, see, everybody thinks she was there because she was the man's mother. I don't think so. I think there's more to Mary than that because the Bible says there is. At the end of the day, Mary is somebody whose mind is convinced. These are three different aspects of the soul. Her mind is convinced. In Luke chapter 1, verse 38, Gabriel is speaking to her and tells her all these things she's going to do. You're going to do this. And she asks, well, how can that be? I've never slept with a guy, and, and everybody's going to hate me. And everybody, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, when she hears and understands this is God's will, what is her answer in Luke 1, 38? Behold the servant of God. In Luke chapter 1, verse 45, she visits Elizabeth, and Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, describes her and says of Mary, blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said shall be accomplished. See, Mary at the end of the day is somebody who is convinced in her mind, if this is what God wants, this is the way it's going to be. I'm kind of in this category. I don't care what all these guys say. In my mind, I have decided... This is the will of God. This is the word of God. These guys are living together. I'm supposed to say something. Whether it costs me the relationship or not, whether the whole family hates me now, I am supposed to stand up, not remain silent. I'm supposed to say something. When everybody is going same-sex marriage, rainbow coalition, I am supposed to say that is an abomination against God. And everybody may defriend me on Facebook. Nobody's going to want to talk to me anymore. Nobody's going to be my friend anymore. But my mind tells me that is what I'm supposed to do. And I will do it. Number two, there's John. First, Mary of the mind. Two, John of the heart. He loves Jesus so much. And Jesus' love for him is so important that he doesn't even identify himself, Elder, as John when he writes about himself. He calls himself the apostle that Jesus loved because the love of Jesus is so important to him. It's what motivates him. He has a passion for Jesus. He loves Jesus. And he will not, cannot, shall not stand there 
and not support Jesus. And so he is going to be there, the only male to openly stand and support Jesus at the cross was the Apostle John. And some people wonder, why is he the only one that was not martyred? Why is he the only one that even Peter in John, 20, uh, in, in, in John 22 is asking, how come he's not going to be martyred? How come he's not going to be killed? And Jesus says, if, he, if I'm going to let him live until I return, what is that to you? You, you do what I tell you to. But I think much of it is because Jesus remembers when he was hanging there and everybody was shouting and everybody was looking for other people to grab and arrest, John stayed. Finally, there's Mary of Magdala. Out of her, the Bible says, came seven demons. Mary is an exercise of the mind. John is an exercise of the heart. Mary is an exercise of the will. In Mark 16, 9, it says seven devils came out of her. See, here's the thing about Mary. She remembers where she was. She remembers the sinner she was. She remembers the vile things that she did. And she remembers Jesus reached out. And Jesus saved her. And Jesus forgave her. And Jesus loves her. And her heart is fixed now on Jesus. And she will not back down from supporting him. In Revelation chapter 2, it's talking about the Ephesian church. We're actually going to talk about this two Wednesdays from now. It says, you have forsaken your first love. Remember, this is the way to not, not forsake your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent. There is something about realizing how sin, sinful you were and what Jesus saved you from that causes the will to be focused in the soul towards Jesus. And here's what the Holy Spirit told me. As I was praying about this message, I feel like the Holy Spirit said, Wendell, you have many Marys in your church. You have many Johns. You have many people who are standing up for me in the face of horrific and terrible pressure. And rather than giving in to being frightened, rather giving in to the lie that they're abandoned, rather than giving in to the confusion, they research the word, they understand what you said, they receive it, and they walk and they stand up for you. Blessed are you for standing up for the Lord. On this Palm Sunday, this is what my challenge and my exhortation to you is. Maybe you realize you've actually been one of the people in the middle, slowly turning because of society, slowly turning because of what you physically want in your flesh you desire, slowly turning because you're frightened, slowly turning because you're confused and betrayed by God. Turn back. This morning, turn back. With every eyes shut, every head bowed, let me pray for you. And first of all, let me commend you. If you are one of those who've been standing up, like John, like Mary, blessed are you. May the Lord bless you and strengthen you and increase your resolve with a double portion. Like he said to Joshua, the original Joshua, be strong and courageous and go in and take the land. For those of you who have been turning, stop. Turn back. Return to your first love. It's an easy thing. Just tell them, Lord, I know I've been turning away. Forgive me. I come back home this morning. I, I come back home now. I will stand up for you. I will be like John. It doesn't matter to me how much everybody reviles me or doesn't understand. Your word says, speak for you and I shall. Be strong and courageous, CCI. Be faithful and loyal and true. God will bless you for it. He will cover you with his wings. He will fill you with healing and deliverance and lift you up. In the name of Jesus, we all say amen. Thanks for coming this morning. God bless you guys. Oh, and I also promise, Easter service will not be this long. I will be done. We will be done by 11.